Well, I'm just so happy to welcome everybody to our 296th gathering of the Right Care Initiative. I am delighted that we have uh, medical directors and pharmacy directors, quality improvement enthusiasts from across the state of California and several other states joining us today. So uh, with that, I want to um, remind everyone that we will not have a meeting in December. Everybody's gonna have a lovely holiday break, time to get some serious R&R &R and uh, regroup. We will have our next meeting after this on January 10th from noon to two o'clock on the topic of diabetes and obesity. That um, uh, meeting will be um, a collaborative meeting across several states. And today I want to just thank all of our amazing volunteers and also our uh, financial supporters without whom we would not be doing this work to spread best practices. So our mothership is UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And uh, we have significant uh, collaborative arrangements with multiple universities across the state, uh, including the University of Southern California, and Stanford, uh, and the UCs across the state. Um, I wanna also thank the California chapter, the American College of Cardiology for their support, as well as uh, the Stroke Awareness Foundation, the Tennis Getter Foundation, and uh, Blue Shield of California. In addition, I'd love to thank our biopharmaceutical supporters, Johnson & Johnson, Genentech, Novo Nordisk, Health Trust, Beringer Ingelheim, Amarin, and Amgen. And I should say Health Trust is uh, one of our foundation supporters in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, and again, we're so grateful to the biopharmaceutical industry for getting us through this pandemic. I think we all feel that we can sleep better at night knowing that we've had the vaccine and the boosters. And so thank goodness for the leading edge scientists like our speakers today, just an amazing lineup of speakers. Next slide, please. Most of you all know me. Uh, the one thing that I have in common with our first speaker, Rupi Sandhu, is that we both did our master's degree at Harvard and enjoyed watching ice hockey there. Uh, next slide, please. In this collaborative project, which uh, stems the state, uh, we are very enthusiastically supported by the former chief health lawyer for the state of California who wrote most of the uh, laws governing healthcare in California. Uh, Warren Barnes um, reminded everyone and continues to that in the Right Care Initiative, we compete against disease and not each other. Next slide, please. So our goals remain very focused. We focus on uh, preventing heart attack strokes and diabetic complications. We dabble a little bit in best practices for heart failure and also uh, COVID, whatever the highest need is of the group. So our schedules are driven by what our medical leaders need. Uh, by driving uh, LDL cholesterol to less than 100, blood pressure less than 140 over 90, and blood sugar hemoglobin A1C less than eight, um, we have had some fairly significant success. Our work is associated with a greater than 20% decline in acute myocardial infarctions in the one community where we've tested these uh, best practices. Next slide, please. So this is a synthesis slide of the key ways that we uh, have adopted as our formula for um, achieving those targets. And the number one thing is you have to activate the patient. You have to get them enthusiastically adopting the goals of 
um, cholesterol control, blood sugar control, blood pressure control, and then the clinical teams can really get to work. Um, we believe in following uh, nationally and internationally endorsed guidelines. We believe in team-based care. The adding a clinical pharmacist to the care team is essential. And we believe that you should do as much as possible in an outpatient setting through intensive ambulatory care and really engaging the patient in uh, biomonitoring themselves. Next slide, please. So um, with that, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm thrilled that Ed Yu has joined us just a few minutes ago from Palo Alto Medical Foundation, where he is our co-chair uh, of the Right Care Silicon Valley University Best Practices. He's also, his big hat, is Chief Quality Officer for the flagship Sutter uh, Medical Group that, how long has Palo Alto Medical Foundation been around? A hundred years, Ed? Tell us, tell us a bit. And 80, with, 83 with, years, I believe. <laughs> well, um, I'm thrilled that you were able to break away to join us, and I'd like to hand the baton to you at this time. Oh, well, thank you, Hattie, for that uh, warm overview of our work here in the Right Care Initiative. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome, on behalf of uh, the Right Care Initiative, Dr. Rufi Sandu, MD and PhD. Uh, she's a clinical uh, electrical physiologist by training and holds the title of Associate Professor of Cardiology at Cedar Sinai Medical Center. If that's enough, not enough, she actually holds multiple secondary academic appointments at many uh, stellar institutes, including my alma mater, UCLA, uh, University of Alberta in Canada, and also at the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital as well in the East Coast. Her research interest is focused on healthcare services and epidemiology, specifically in the field of cardiac electrophysiology, and we look forward very much to learn from her, from her work. And on behalf of the Right Care Initiative, thank you, Dr. Sandu, and I'll turn the floor over to you to hear your wonderful presentation. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it really is a privilege to be uh, with you all. Thank you so much for um, letting me speak today on a topic that is near and dear to my heart and that is detecting undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. And can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes, we can. All right, excellent. So I thought I'd start with a case presentation. You have a 75 year old man who presents to clinic for routine follow-up. He has past medical history significant for hypertension, it's controlled and non-obstructive coronary disease and you have him on really good medication, and he really isn't complaining about a thing. And then he tells you that his nephew is a physician, and he gave him this heart rhythm recording device. And so he pulls out his phone and shows you a saved 30-second strip. And I'll just let you look at this for a few seconds. And so I would ask you to think about this um, now, and then maybe we can discuss this at the end of the talk uh, because we don't have an official way to do a poll. But based on this rhythm strip, do you order a 12 lead ECG? Do you order external rhythm monitor? Do you optimize AF risk factors? start medication for rate control and initiate oral anticoagulation therapy after discussion with patient? Or do you ignore it? Technologies are notoriously bad at detecting AF, so there's no way you're gonna believe it. So for this talk, I am briefly gonna go over the rationale for AF screening. I really focus on what is the optimal screening method, population and setting, what is the clinical significance of screen detected AF? Do we have to worry about any harms of screening? And what are the future needs in this area? 
So as many of you know, AFib is the most common sustained cardiac rhythm disorder. Worldwide, it is estimated that there are about 33 and a half million people with AFib. This is a map that shows the age-adjusted prevalence rates per 100,000 population of AF. It really demonstrates that the highest AF rates are in North America. U.S. epidemiological studies have conservatively projected AF prevalence to double over the next 30 years if the rate of increase in the incidence stays the same. But if the rate of increase follows a similar pattern to what we've uh, seen in the prior 20 years, that prevalence rate is going to be considerable, almost estimated at 16 million. And this rapidly rising prevalence is really due to an aging population and increasing risk factors for developing AFib, including adverse lifestyle factors and cardiovascular illness. Now, clinically, the consequences associated with AFib are significant. The most devastating is stroke. So AF is responsible for 20 to 30% of all ischemic strokes, imparting up to a five-fold increased risk. And importantly, strokes related to AF are more likely to reoccur and lead to longer, more long-term morbidity, higher mortality, greater resource utilization, compared to strokes unrelated to AF. And then you have heart failure. And heart failure is now becoming one of the leading consequences of AFib. It's estimated to occur in about 20 to 30% of AF patients. And AFib alone is associated with a threefold increased risk in developing heart failure. Now, the symptoms that patients have and the treatment we offer them can lead to significant impairment in quality of life with more than 60% of patients have reported reduced quality of life associated with AFib. And this of course can lead to other psychological issues such as depression. And most importantly, AFib is associated with a 1.5 to 3.5 increased risk for death. And that excess mortality is really related to the stroke, heart failure and comorbidities. And there's, of course, other consequences of AF that are now emerging with accumulating evidence to suggest a relationship between AF and cognitive decline, just an example as something that's emerging. The impact of AF on healthcare utilization and cost is considerable for many countries, as you can see uh, from this figure on the left. And the largest proportion of direct healthcare costs are due to hospitalizations. In the US, 44% of the 6.65 billion that was spent on AFib in just one year in 2005 was attributable to hospital admissions with AF being that principal diagnosis. So clearly AFib is associated with significant morbidity, mortality and costs. And so screening for AFib would be ideal to try to reduce some of those complications. But in, this has really evolved in the most recent years. There's been an enormous interest in AFib. And there are several additional reasons for screening that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first is that in a considerable proportion of individuals with AF, there's a lack of symptoms. So AF is undetected and therefore undertreated. And the precise prevalence of patients with asymptomatic or clinically silent AFib, it's difficult to determine. And one retrospective cohort modeling study using commercial and Medicare administrative claims data, it was estimated that, five, uh, that of the 5.3 million Americans with AFib, about 15% were found to have undiagnosed AF and over half of them were at high risk for stroke. Other studies have estimated up to one third of patients diagnosed with AFib are asymptomatic. Second, there have been real advances in technologies and devices that simplify rhythm monitoring, whereas previously the 12-lead ECG was our primary diagnostic tool. And I think lastly, and maybe even most importantly, we now have the availability of safe and effective stroke prevention therapy. 
that is easier to administer compared to warfarin. So in this meta-analysis, NOACs or non-vitamin K antagonists were compared with warfarin and showed a reduction in stroke and systemic embolism of 19%, a reduction in total mortality of 10%, and impressively, a reduction in intracranial bleeding of 52%. So clearly there are several potential benefits of AF screening that you could probably come up with with the slides that I've already presented. So screening might provide an opportunity for AF detection with early initiation of stroke prevention therapy to reduce the risk of AF-related complications, such as stroke. It can prevent or reverse electrical or mechanical atrial remodeling, any AF-related hemodynamic derangements, atrial and ventricular tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy, AF-related morbidity, healthcare utilization and costs, and mortality. And it can reduce conditions associated with AF that are diagnosed only because of the workup you're doing because someone has AFib. So something like obstructive sleep apnea. So it's important to consider um, a few things when you're thinking about AF screening. So for example, what is the best screening approach? Is it opportunistic? And by that, I mean that you're taking advantage of an opportunity. For example, whenever a patient visits their GP, they get some AF screening done, for example, pulse palpation. And this is different than systematic screening. So this is when you target a certain population. Like, for example, you say, I'm going to take anybody over the age of 65 and I'm going to invite them to participate in screening. So other things to consider is what is that target population? Is it the general population? Is it a high risk subgroup? What is the optimal screening strategy? Do we wanna target everybody in the population? Do we wanna focus on people that attend a primary care clinic um, or a cardiologist or inpatient? And then which screening tool do we even use to do this? So let's review a few of the key screening studies that provide a glimpse into these answers. So what screening population should be targeted? This is data from a multi-country patient level meta-analysis of about 140,000 individuals from 19 studies to help define age cutoff. And after adjusting for age and sex, which we know influence the prevalence of AF, the screen detected AF rate was 1.44% for those 65 years or older, compared to only 0.41% for those less than 65 years. And this is using a single time point screen in a general ambulant population. So this yields a number needed to screen of 69 to identify one new AF case for patients 65 years of age or older. And this uh, was irrespective of the screening methodology, device, the geographical region, and setting. None of these factors influence the AF detection rate. So there are very few randomized clinical trials of AF screening, and we really do take RCTs as our gold standard, particularly comparing different strategies and or screening tools and that have also performed an economic evaluation. So the, I'd like to present this one, um, the UK Screening Atrial Fibrillation in the Elderly or SAFE trial. It was one of the largest of the screening studies that have been performed. It was done in 50 primary care practices with over 14,000 patients. They took anybody over the age of 65 and they randomized them to one of two intervention groups. So the intervention group consisted either of opportunistic case finding with pulse palpation, followed by ECG confirmation if an irregular pulse was palpated, or systematic screening, so that everybody got pulse palpation and everyone got an ECG. And they were compared to usual control. There was a 1.6-fold higher odds of detecting new cases of AF when you performed some type of screening. So in the intervention group, whether it was opportunistic 
or it was systemic screening. And you can see that the AF detection rate was actually the same in both the opportunistic and systematic arm. But when you did further economic um, evaluation, what we saw was that opportunistic screening, so that pulse palpation followed by ECG, if there was an irregular pulse that was palpated, was associated with a lower incremental cost and dominated compared to any other screening strategies. And using probabilistic sensitivity analysis, at any threshold ICER or the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, opportunistic screening was shown to be 60% cost effective in men and women, which is quite good. So the challenge with single time point screening is that it offers just a finite window of observation, which is particularly problematic in the context of paroxysmal AFib. So this limitation of single time point was really shown in the stroke stop study. This was a population based study of systematic AF screening using intermittent ambulatory ECG recording over a two week period for those 75 and 76 years old in Sweden. So of the 14,000 individuals that were invited, 54 per participated and newly diagnosed AF occurred in three 0.0% of the subjects. And the study demonstrated that repeated rhythm assessment led to a fourfold increase in AF detection over just a single time point screening. So this was an initial single lead ECG that was performed at study entry. 9.3% have reported previous AFib and 78% were receiving oral anticoagulation therapy, which is actually much higher than previously reported in real world studies. Untreated, uh, AFib represented 5.1%. All of them had a cardiology visit as part of their study care pathway, which I think is a really important point. This resulted in 93% of AF patients being treated with oral anticoagulation therapy. And of those known AFs, another, almost another half were started on oral anticoagulation. And so although it's effective in case finding, the utility of screening is really dependent on population engagement if you're going to take a systematic approach as opposed to opportunistic. And in this study, using this approach, only 50 to 75 percent of eligible patients participated in screening, which, you know, you have to think to yourself, is that enough? So it makes sense that the more um, that you're going to identify more AFib, the more the longer you monitor. In the M stops randomized clinical trial of just over 2,600 individuals at increased risk for AF, immediate monitoring now using a self-applied ECG patch, so two weeks continuous monitoring compared with delayed ECG monitoring for four months led to a significantly higher rate of AF detection. Um, what they defined as AF was anything that was 30 seconds of continuous um, AFib or A flutter. Now a secondary endpoint was new AF diagnosis at one year in the combined actively monitored group versus matched observational cohort. And in the observational study, you see over uh, 12 months of follow-up, there was 190 new cases of AF that were detected at 6.7 per 100 person years in the actively monitored cohort and 2.6 just in the observational cohort. So that's an absolute difference of four when you are actively monitoring using continuous, uh, a continuous ECG tool. And most recently published was the screen AF study. And what they did was they really took the prior evidence into account and they targeted knowledge gaps. So they examined whether AF detection rates increase if you're using opportunistic screening and targeting a high risk population and you're using long-term monitoring. It's a multi-center randomized clinical trial. Again, very few randomized clinical trials exist. They took 800, just over 800 participants that were 75 years or older with hypertension requiring antihypertensive medications and no prior history of AF. 
and they recruited them from 48 primary care clinics in Canada and Germany. And what the study did was it investigated a standard approach of pulse palpation and auscultation in clinic. So they did that at baseline in six months, and they compared it to a two-week continuous ECG patch monitor at baseline and three months in addition to standard of care. The primary outcome was AFib or atrial flutter, and they define this as one or more episode lasting greater than five minutes with continuous monitoring or diagnosed clinically by a 12 lead ECG at six months. Now the key findings were that a screening approach with continuous ECG patch monitoring yielded a tenfold higher increase in AF detection rate compared to standard of care. Additionally, when you looked at the AFib episodes, most of them were paroxysmal. They had a median duration of 6.3 hours and they were detected on that first patch monitor after, the, after 24 hours. And interestingly enough, 75% of the patients with AF detected on patch monitor had initiation of oral anticoagulation therapy. So, so far I've presented studies that have really focused on the GP um, office. So taking opportunistic screening um, in a place that a lot of patients um, are seen. But there are also alternative screening environments that exist that could be leveraged for um, opportunities using um, different healthcare professionals to perform AF screening. So I just wanted to show you this uh, study that we conducted in Canada. It was the first community screening study and it was a stroke risk reduction program that was implemented for patients that were 65 years or older who attended community pharmacists in two of our provinces, Alberta and Ontario. All these, um, all these clientele were not receiving oral anticoagulation. We enrolled about 1,100 patients in just over six months. Participants were screened for AF using a handheld ECG device. They had their blood pressure assessed and they had diabetes risk estimated using a Canadian diabetes risk assessment questionnaire. And patients were encouraged to follow up with their GP after um, participating in the screening program. The GPs were provided all the test results and they were actually also provided recommendations uh, consistent with uh, the guidelines at that time. And what we found was actionable AF. So we defined actionable as uh, previously undetected or known AFib that was untreated was 2.5%. This is actually um, one of the uh, higher prevalences that had been reported in the literature. And not surprisingly, we found that your prevalence of AF really increases uh, with age. A blood pressure of greater than 140 at night uh, over 90 was found in over half the patients. And similarly, uh, almost half were found to be at high risk for diabetes. So at three months, we had followed everybody up. And what was interesting was that only 17% were started on oral anticoagulation therapy. Half had improved blood pressure and 71 had confirmatory diabetes testing really demonstrating to us that AF screening can be feasible in an alternative study a setting like a pharmacy, but if you don't link it with the next steps in care, you may not get um, the result that you want in terms of optimal management. And we did do an economic analysis. We found a cost per person screened of $66. The model estimated that compared to no screening, the screening intervention would have resulted in higher expected cost. It was $26 more, but more um, life years and more qualities um, over a long, a long, a lifelong um, time horizon, yielding an incremental cost per quality gained of just over um, $7,400 which is less than that 50,000 50, uh, standard threshold that we usually think about with um, interventions. <laughs>
Now, I wanted to briefly touch on the potential for consumer-driven screening, particularly in light of the explosion of wearable technologies. I think this was first shown in the Apple Watch Series 4, came out with a heart monitoring ECG, and you have a digital crown. It contains a, a titanium electrode that was new, that was different than um, previous uh, watches, that reads the electrical heart impulses in your fingertip and the back of the crystal um, electrode. At the back of the crystal electrode, there's an ultra thin chromium silicone carbon nitride layer that's applied to the sapphire crystal that reads electrical heart impulses in your wrist. And it can give you a message such as this, where it can say that your rhythm is suggestive of atrial fibrillation, sinus rhythm, or inconclusive. So the Apple Heart Study, um, a, a, a large study that was done by investigators at Stanford, uh, what they did was they took participants without atrial fibrillation, not on oral anticoagulation, and that was self-reported, and they used the Apple iPhone app to self-enroll. And the study used the Apple Watch photoplasmography sensor, which uses light emitting and light sensitive diodes to intermittently and passively measure changes in blood, in blood flow while participants were at rest. And then these signals were used to generate pulse intervals called tachograms over a one minute period, which were classified as either regular or irregular on the basis of the variation in the pulse interval. So detection of five out of six repeat tachograms of an irregular pulse within a 48-hour period triggered a notification that was sent via the app to contact the study physician for video consultation to determine the need for an ECG patch that was worn for seven days. The primary endpoints were AFib greater than 30 seconds on ECG patch in patients 65 years or older, simultaneous AFib on ECG patch and the individual tachogram, and secondarily, they looked at simultaneous AFib on the ECG patch with the notification and self-reported contact with a healthcare provider. So close to 500,000 um, participants self-enrolled in over eight months. Out of those, 0.5% had an irregular pulse notification. Of those, 44% well, initiated a first visit. 70% had an ECG patch shipped to them. And about the similar amount returned the ECG patch for analysis. And what they found was similar rates of AFib occurred overall and in patients that were 65 years or older of the total 450 participants who returned the ECG patch. So among participants notified with an irregular pulse, the positive predictive value was 0.84 for AFib on ECG and simultaneous with an irregular pulse notification, and a little bit lower at 0.71 for AFib on the ECG simultaneous with an irregular tachogram. Of note, 57% contacted a healthcare provider outside the study. And so I just wanted to go over some of the strengths and limitations of this study. Um, an impressive number of patients enrolled over a short period of time uh, is a major strength. Second, there, this was a virtual method of enrollment and management, which is quite cost effective. When you think about typical trials, they cost about $30,000 per patient. This was 1% of that cost. And it used consumer-directed technology. Some of the limitations of the study were, the, they really, this was a low risk population, right? 80% were less than 55, 70% um, white, uh, so not a lot of ethnic uh, racial diversity, only 13% were high risk of stroke. 
there was quite a high loss to follow up. So 80% of the population didn't contact their physician or return a patch. So that makes you think that if an approach like this is going to be taken in the future, you really need to think about the level of engagement that's needed um, by the population that you're screening. 15% had prior AF, and this may have made the algorithm look better. And it's important to remember this, this was not designed to assess the algorithm as a screening tool because you didn't measure sensitivity or specificity or, fall, or um, your fall, uh, false positive rate. Um, and then, you know, this is, um, I think, an individual uh, limitation, but people may just not want Apple or anyone else to own their data. So the studies that I presented so far have shown you that clinically unrecognized AFib can be detected through a variety of screening approaches. But the real question is, is what is the clinical significance of screen detected AF? Much of the data demonstrating the, an association between undiagnosed AFib and stroke arises from atrial high rate episodes detected on uh, cardiac electro, electronic implantable devices rather than screening studies. So I think that's a really important point to stress. This is a table that shows uh, the major studies examining atrial high rate events and thromboembolic, um, subsequent thromboembolic events. And there's data to suggest there's at least a doubling of thromboembolic risk when you have these atrial high rate episodes that are present compared to when they're absent. Though the vast majority of these studies are limited by small sample size and number of clinical events. But is, is these atrial high rate events that show an association with thromboembolic risk the same as having actual clinical atrial fibrillation? So I wanted to present this example. It's from the TRENDS study. It showed that the overall mean CHADS of the population enrolled was 2.2. The stroke rate for people who had atrial high rate events that were lasting 5.5 5 hours or greater was 2.4% per year. Now, this is considerably lower than the 4% annualized rate of stroke in patients with clinical AF. It's not a singular finding. Studies have consistently demonstrated among patients with similar risk profiles, the stroke rate with atrial high rate events is much lower than clinical AFib. So maybe there's a minimum significant burden associated with thromboembolic events. And when comparing different AF burden cut points, the ASSERT trial found that if you had an atrial high rate event that was greater than 24 hours, that you had significantly higher subsequent risk of ischemic stroke or uh, systemic embolism. And this risk was approximately 5% per year, which is comparable to the risk of clinical AF. But there was no significant difference in outcomes if you had shorter atrial high rate events. So you can see there, Anything shorter, even at six hours to 24, six minutes to six hours, and of course, no atrial high rate events, not associated with increased risk. So ultimately, we wanna know whether screening for AFib and treatment with oral anticoagulation reduces outcomes. There were two uh, recent publications in Lancet uh, that provide us some data to answer that question. Again, coming back to the stroke stop study, which we looked at in um, our previous slides, just to review one-to-one -one randomization of patients invited to screening versus uh, control group. So all randomly assigned individuals followed an intention to treat analysis for a minimum of five years. So the follow-up ended up being a median of 6.9 years. And they looked at the primary composite endpoint of ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, systematic embolism, bleeding leading to hospitalization, and all-cause mortality. And what they found was that there was a small benefit of screening with regards to the primary endpoint. You look at that, that's a 4% reduction. And the p-value is really right at that level um, below uh, significance. 
there was no difference in the individual components of the primary endpoint between the two groups. Um, and the use of oral anticoagulation was similar in both the intervention and the control group at baseline, and, and both of them had uh, uh, increased over the study period at the same degree. This was the second study. It was the LOOP study. It examined whether continuous um, eats electrocardiographic monitoring using, a, uh, using an implantable loop recorder. So it's really a device that's the size of my pinky that sits underneath the skin. It can last up to three years, um, can facilitate detection of asymptomatic AFib episodes and whether that AF screening and use of oral anticoagulation can prevent subsequent stroke or systemic embolism in individuals at high risk. So 6,000 participants, Older population, 70 and 90 years, with one additional stroke risk factor and without AFib, randomized in a one to three fashion to ILR versus usual care in four centers in Denmark. Median of 64.5 months, detection of AFib defined as six minutes or greater. And this occurred with a threefold higher in the implantable loop recorder group versus the control. So you see 32% versus 12%. Oral anticoagulation much higher uh, in the ILR group, 30% versus 13% in the control. And the primary outcome, you can see that there was no difference in um, the primary outcome in the two groups. And additionally, no difference in all cause mortality or major bleeding. So you can say, well, what, what would explain the differences between these two studies, keeping in mind that the stroke stop study didn't show a huge benefit to oral anticoagulation, but things to consider may be um, the types of AF detected. So when you have an implantable loop recorder, you're picking up very short episodes uh, of what you can call as AFib or you know, atrial high rate events, whereas in intermittent ECG screening, you have to think that if it picks up AFib, these are probably in individuals that have uh, a higher burden of AFib. And that burden may be more clinically meaningful than the shorter episodes. The primary endpoint was a lot more restrictive in the loop. Um, if you remember from the stroke stop, they had like they had a composite endpoint of um, four different things. In the ILR group uh, from the loop study, they actually had a, uh, the control group had a high AF rate that, that was detected, uh, which was um, higher than expected. And then uh, there's early discontinuation about 12% of patients in the ILR group, and, and maybe that explained the um, negative result. So just to quickly go over the potential um, harms of AF screening, because I presented potential benefits, there hasn't been um, a real focus on this aspect in a lot of screening studies, but you might anticipate what those harms may be. Anxiety for the patient having been diagnosed AFib, where um, ECG misinterpretation may lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. The ECG may also detect other abnormalities, either true or false positives, that may lead to invasive tests and treatments that have potential serious harms. So should we be performing AF screening? Based on the available evidence, guidelines and consensus documents offer varying endorsements. There's no formal recommendation from US cardiology professional societies, but uh, the 2020 European Society of Cardiology, the 2017 uh, European Heart Rhythm Association, uh, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society's 2020 AF guidelines, and even the consensus uh, document from the AF Screen International Collaboration have all really targeted uh, screening for an opportunistic screening for those people who are 65 years or older by taking either pulse or ECG rhythm strip. And that you may consider systematic screening, but specifically in that same population as the stroke stop study. Now, the Heart Rhythm Society is currently developing a white paper on the clinical utilization of digital health technology. So I think that would be um, an interesting document to read in terms of um, what the uh, recommendations might be.
So how does a condition become acceptable for screening? Almost 50 years ago, Wilson and Jungner developed screening criteria on behalf of the World Health Organization to guide in the selection of conditions that would be suitable for population-based screening. And I thought I'd just quickly go over those questions and answers as they relate to AFib. So number one, the condition shot, the SOT should be an important health problem. And hopefully I've convinced you of um, AFib really qualifying as an epidemic with uh, significant morbidity and mortality. The question that really stands out in my mind is what is stroke risk in these screened patients? Two, there should be an accepted treatment for patients with recognized disease. And again, uh, I think it's well established, um, oral anticoagulation is cost-effective, uh, safe um, and effective therapy. And three facilities for diagnosis and treatment should be available. And, and there are facilities in healthcare systems for diagnosis and treatment. Four, there should be a recognizable latent or early symptomatic stage. And here we know that AFib is not always associated with symptoms and stroke may be the first manifestation. Screening really allows us to identify that at-risk patient prior to suffering a stroke. Five, there should be suitable test or examination. I think that this is evolving. There's numerous suitable and validated method, uh, methods for AF screening existing from pulse check to handheld devices, smartphone apps. Um, but I think it is really important to validate any of the new technologies that are gonna be used for screening. The test should be acceptable to the population. And I, I think there is evidence to suggest that it's acceptable to participants and to healthcare professionals. Seven, the natural history of the condition, including development from latent to declared disease should be adequately understood. And I think here the mechanism for developing AF-related stroke is understood, but more research is really needed regarding the natural history of silent or asymptomatic AFib. There should be an agreed policy on whom to treat as patients. And I think here there are a few um, guidelines for oral anticoagulation therapy in screen positive patients. And that's what we really want to know. You can screen them, but then what are you supposed to do with them? Nine, the cost of case binding should be economically balanced in relation, relationship to possible expenditure. And there is growing evidence to suggest AF screening is cost effective. And then lastly, case binding should be continuing process and not a once and for all project. Again, um, we have seen that there are uh, recommendations for opportunistic screening uh, for those 65 years or older, but the time period for screening has not been defined. So just to summarize, um, I hope I've uh, presented to you that asymptomatic or silent AFib is common. And in addition to uh, the emerging technologies and uh, the, the oral anticoagulation that is available, um, that screening is something that we should be thinking about um, pursuing. But I would just really emphasize that further research is needed to define that optimal uh, method, population, and setting for screening. That we should validate all new screening technologies and devices that we really need to know what the clinical significance of screen detected AF is, because I think it's clear that not all the AF that is detected is equally um, clinically significant. So, you know, the shorter episodes may not be, but the longer episodes may be. We need to really emphasize um, performing studies that look at harms of screening. And, most importantly, we need to develop structured referral platforms for screen positive cases for clinical evaluation and provide optimal management of confirmed AF. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions and I thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Sandhu. This is Nirali Vora. Sorry, I was late. I'm one of the stroke neurologists and I'm speaking right after you. But that was a great um, tour de force of the current data for screening AF and also the importance of stroke, which I'm gonna kind of reframe and cover again in a moment. I guess um, if you had to put your money down, 
uh, for the, you know, eager 40 to 60 year old who wants to do everything in their power to prevent stroke, what will you tell them when they say, should I wear an Apple watch and monitor my rhythm? Yeah, well, it's great to meet you. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Um, and that is like, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I think it's, hard not to want to empower your patients if they feel like they're at high risk for stroke um, and they are really enthusiastic about um, using a wearable, which, you know, a lot of people have. It's not something that they go out to buy, um, but they already have an Apple Watch. Um, I think that that's a discussion that, that you need to have with that individual patient, particularly the points that you want to talk about is if we do find AFib, what are we going to do about this? Is this going to be something where, first of all, we have to confirm that it's atrial fibrillation? Are we going to focus on modifying risk factors? Um, are we going to look at stroke risk? And if you're at high risk, are we going to start you on a blood thinner knowing that there's really um, just limited data on whether uh, that provides clinical benefit. So I think that really needs to be an individual discussion uh, with your patient and outlining the, the care plan that you will have. You're on mute. Thanks so much. I, I completely agree with that approach that it needs to be personalized, it needs to be honest about the data. And there's going to be anxiety around what the findings are and recognizing that there are false positives, et cetera. Other questions that people have? Dr. Yu, I see you're popping up. Yeah, I was going to prompt Dr. Sandu to answer the polling question that she had at the beginning because as a primary care physician in Silicon Valley, we have patients bring in and say, hey, my watch says I have a normal rhythm. I want to be treated. And uh, sometimes we, going back to the previous question, it's uh, we don't have that sure decision-making step. The patient just goes as and does it and comes into us asking us for advice. So in the current state, what's your thought about what should be the approach? Well, I think that even if you um, don't have that discussion before they start the screening, I think that it's completely valid to have it when they present that ECG strip to you, because I don't think it changes whether you knew ahead of time or not. I think that, but you do need to be very clear about um, the, the evidence that exists and the approach and that everybody is on the same page with the plan um, and that it's well-documented. Um, you know, I've done screening studies. I did that one in Canada um, and we started people on blood thinners and Luckily, you know, we, we didn't have any adverse, uh, adverse events, but I feel like maybe it only takes one where everybody's perception changes on, on AF screening and starting oral anticoagulation. They go back to, well, where's the data, right? Um, and it's true. There's, there's a paucity of data. Other questions people have, and um, if you're welcome to put it in the chat or the Q&A section as well. I wonder, uh, Dr. Sandu, <clears throat> what uh, lifestyle recommendations do you make? Since there is this paucity of data, are there lifestyle things that can occur that's going to lower that risk of stroke and help satisfy the patient that they are being proactive about what they're learning on their rhythms? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think it's really important to stress uh, healthy lifestyles. So, you know, um, if they're overweight, uh, because obesity is a, a, a very strong uh, independent risk factor for developing clinical AFib. So we're looking at uh, weight reduction. And actually, that was um, a new recommendation that was included in the two, 2019 AHA ACC um, guidelines for atrial fibrillation that hadn't previously been there before. Uh, alcohol um, can definitely be a, um, a trigger for atrial fibrillation. So um, assessing the um, quantity of alcohol that's being used. Um, exercise, I mean, for some people it's a trigger, um, for others it's not. Um, so I think um, other things is, 
uh, going through other screening questions. For example, I brought up obstructive sleep apnea, and that's really a big uh, comorbidity that is usually um, under uh, under screened and under treated, and has a strong association with AFib. Um, so I really think about those kinds of things, and I think people would be happy to know. Previously, we used to always um, ask about caffeine uh, consumption and say, "Oh no, no, you can't drink uh, coffee." But really, there there's some recent um, evidence to suggest that there's no um, association between caffeine and um, atrial fibrillation risk. So they'll like you for that. They won't like you for quitting the, the red wine. Well, Dr. Sandu, another question that comes up sometimes, does the frequency of the short appearing AFib have a factor here? I mean, getting to lone AFib versus paroxysmal AFib versus persistent. So this may be a little bit off track, but sometimes I just wondered, does it matter if someone had 24 hour one episode versus uh, 20 episodes of less than 30 seconds of AFib, are there any differences in terms of approach from your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, if I saw 24 hours of, a, of, of this um, AFib, I would be concerned. I would definitely, um, you know, take the approach of assessing AFib risk factors and, and management. Um, if I saw, you know, um, numerous episodes that equal 24 hours. I mean, we really don't know. Um, there is emerging data to say that maybe we shouldn't be looking at a distinct uh, threshold, like greater than five minutes or five hours, but maybe we should be looking at AF burden. So the, uh, um, the quantity of AF over a period of time. Um, and um, that, that was shown um, in the KP rhythm study. And um, really, if you had a high burden, and I think they had this cutoff of 11% based on statistics, there was an increased risk for stroke. Uh, but again, um, I, I do think we need to do a better job defining uh, what that what that um, AF quantity should be, whether it's burden or it's episodes, what it, you know, how long those episodes should be. So great, great question. Thank you. Maybe one more on the technology part, and I uh, fully understand that this is kind of outside your comfort zone. But there are so many wearables on the market, and I don't know how it's regulated and all that. But from your perspective, are there, if we have a patient that's interested in doing so, uh, are there any recommendations or guidelines on how to choose which wearable device to use so to minimize the anxiety and all the false positives that can come along with this? Yeah, again, another great, great question. A lot of the technology has actually been um, validated, um, but you want to think about what's easy for um, the, the individual patient. So, you know, things like um, the Alive Core or the Cardia app has a lot of data behind it. Um, obviously, the Apple Watch. Um, there was a recent presentation at AHA uh, with the Fitbit. Um, I think when you have these large studies that have actually looked to see that these algorithms are pretty high in their positive predictive value, um, it's, it's a bit reassuring. I think you need to assess what the patient feels comfortable paying, um, especially when you compare it to just coming into an office and having your pulse palpated, um, you know, something, something like that. Uh, but again, it's important to remember that these tools, uh, like for example, when I talked about Fitbit or the Apple Watch, they didn't look at um, it as a screening tool because they didn't give uh, that um, you know, Apple Watch or Fitbit to a control group and measured uh, AF detection to get sensitivity, specificity, or a false positive rate. Um, but yeah, I, I usually try to go with um, technologies that I think that they can afford and that I know have a, a lot of um, um, strong validation uh, work behind them. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. I think we can keep moving forward um, and have more time later, so. Uh, we can keep moving forward. So I'm the co-chair of Right Care Initiative, and I'm also a stroke neurologist here at Stanford. I really appreciated um, 
the overview we got of AFib and the data. And I'm just going to sort of reiterate what a lot of what's already been said. We'll go quickly so we can get to Dr. Albers next. We'll be presenting um, some more ad advances in acute stroke therapy. So next, uh, I'm going to share my screen actually. And I'm on a different computer, so hopefully this will work. Um, can you guys see bridging the brain? Yes. Yep. You can see your All slide. Right. So just to reiterate, right, stroke is the number one cause of disability. It can affect so many parts of the body. Um, the be fast Bob is sort of our icon to remind people of what the symptoms of stroke are. And here's just an MRI demonstrating an infarct, but it can happen anywhere. And that's really what's leading to the disability that we see. There can also be an accumulation of silent strokes that might be happening from um, behind the scenes. So not causing a clinical focal deficit, but um, little small strokes that might add up. And it's concerning if it could lead to dementia and impact brain health in that way. So both the visible and the invisible injury that comes from stroke is very disabling. And it's our job to stop it. And to prevent stroke and disability, we just really need to know the cause. And this is trying to put into context so much of what we've been talking about today. You already heard a little bit from Dr. Sandu that, you know, there are some major causes for stroke. I like to think of it as impact on the blood vessels, plaque buildup, making about half the strokes that we have. Um, there's a wide range of what's reported for where the heart comes into play, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of strokes. A small percentage might be from thickening in the blood and an even smaller percentage for other causes. There is another 20%, as you add this up, or um, sorry, in this 20 to 40%, what I haven't included is the undetermined causes. And many of those are believed to actually be related to a cardioembolic or atrial fibrillation related causes. So to expand further on the blood vessel causes and the heart causes, I like to think of the two main causes. One is atherosclerosis or plaque buildup in the vessels. We have it in the heart and we have it in the brain. And the area we've focused on today is really the irregular heart rhythm that can lead to blood clot formation at the level of the heart and flick up or cardioembolic phenomena occur up in the brain, leading to ischemic stroke. And once we know the cause, then we can select the right therapy to prevent future strokes. And you sort of saw this, I'm going to reframe it. And this is really trying to get at why blood thinners and the, finding this atrial fibrillation is so critical for stroke prevention. So you saw it a couple of different ways, but an older study really showed that warfarin, sort of the original blood thinner, was 40% better relatively than aspirin to prevent strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation. And there's many, many studies that led to this analysis. And, um, and ultimately, yes, that's about 40% risk reduction. So if we don't find the atrial fibrillation as the source of the stroke, we're missing. It's just a huge missed opportunity. And now that we have the direct oral anticoagulant, the benefit is so amplified because you get better ischemic stroke prevention and less bleeding. This is just one example of a trial, the Averroes trial, where they compared aspirin to apixaban. And over time, patients were having fewer strokes with a PIC scan, uh, one of the direct oral anticoagulants compared to aspirin, and they were also having equivalent bleeding, essentially, so not an increased amount of bleeding. And that just gives us more bang for our buck for knowing when we find atrial fibrillation, we can get very powerful and safe therapy. There's also another therapy, which we haven't talked much about today, um, which is left atrial appendage closure. And that's a surgical procedure that basically can block the atrial appendage of the heart and be an alternative to long-term anticoagulation. And it's been shown to be non-inferior to drugs like warfarin or the direct oral anticoagulants. And so this is just from this recently published Front 17 study using either of these Watchmen or um, amulet devices in order to prevent stroke in the AFib population. I mentioned before that um, there's a large percentage of patients where you don't find the cause of their stroke. And sometimes it's because there's not enough workup. The workup has to reveal the cause or there's many causes and we're not sure what's the real culprit. And in 30% of those patients, AFib was found when, at three years follow-up. 
begging the question, have we looked enough for AFib? And I'm not going to reiterate all this because I think Dr. Sanji went through this a lot, but we have different ways of devices that we can use to look for AFib. And I put a big question mark under smartwatch continuous monitoring because we're still not, as stroke neurologists, fully comfortable with this concept. The, the, there's a lot of false positives, as you heard, um, but and, and there's also the context in which we are doing this when we're having a stroke patient and we're looking for the source of their stroke. We really want continuous rhythm monitoring. And when people use Cardia Mobile or some of these other devices, it's giving you a high quality EKG recording perhaps, but it's not really giving you continuous data to get at those paroxysmal or intermittent AFib um, causes of stroke that Dr. Sanji mentioned. And even the smartwatch, which you're always wearing, is really only recording, I believe, you know, in, in two hour increments. So you're still not getting the full on continuous monitoring. And so we just have to understand this new technology in the context of our clinical care. And I've definitely had many patients coming to my door asking about these and they're really cool. And I think there will be a role for them, but understanding what you're really trying to achieve is critical and not losing sight of what we already have. And so I, I'm really excited to see what the future holds, but it's not yet the standard of care to look for AFib if you've already had a stroke. And um, I won't belabor loop and stroke stop, which you've already heard about, but really it comes down to that million dollar question, which is, does increased detection really change outcomes? Does it prevent strokes? And I think that um, we actually just had a debate in our conference yesterday at Stanford that, you know, the loop study is really interesting because as time went on, it does start to trend towards reducing strokes in the group that had the ongoing monitoring compared to the controls. And you just sort of wonder as time goes on if that benefit really would have been significant. So I think we just need more data and we will get it. Um, so just to summarize, when stroke is caused by atrial fibrillation, treat with anticoagulation. You saw the data or perhaps a closure as an alternative. There are many unknown causes of stroke and they're likely due in part to undetected AFib. So we need better options and continued options to detect AFib while understanding how they impact function. And so I just wanted to give that quick bridge between the brain and stroke from a stroke neurologist perspective and now sort of move to remind people that nothing is 100%. And so when we break through and someone's having an acute stroke, we need to be fast, get to the hospital because there are so many acute therapies available. And so now I wanna hand it over to Dr. Albers to talk about all those acute therapies and we can take questions at the end of this section. So let me stop sharing. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Dr. Greg Albers is my boss and mentor and he's also a full professor an endowed professor here at Stanford. He has been the director of the Stanford Stroke Center since its inception. Can we count the years, Greg? 26? Too many. Oh, yeah. Too many. He's also the um, founding fellowship director and has trained many, many individuals, including myself. I've had the pleasure of working with Greg Albers and really being wowed by the innovative approach he's taken to re redefine our field. And that's a lot of what you're going to be hearing about. You can read the rest of the bio; it speaks for itself. But let's get on to let's get on with it, Greg. Are Thanks, you, Carly. Uh, uh, yes, for? happy to uh, be here and speak to the group. I think this is the second time speaking with your your very impressive group. Um, so we're going to talk about extended window stroke therapy, which is something that, as you mentioned, we've been working on here for a long time. We started the Stroke Center in '92, so. I guess we're a few months away for, from a 30 year anniversary, which is really hard to believe that time has flown so quickly. Uh, but over the 30 years, there has been a, a number of advances in stroke care, and we'll try to hit on a few of those. Uh, in terms of disclosures, uh, there's a software that we developed called Rapid that was involved in some of these trials and uh, was licensed from Stanford to a company called the Schema View, and then uh, Genentech, uh, is obviously the maker of TPA, which has been our main uh, intravenous therapy for stroke for now, uh, you know, 25 years or so. And uh, they also make a drug called TNK, which Stanford has recently adopted as our new uh, 
uh, intravenous therapy for strokes. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So we'll start off with a, a case. Um, this is a call that we sometimes get, which is in an inopportune time, 4.45 in the morning. It's a patient who woke up at 4 a.m. after going to bed at 9 p.m. and had a left-sided weakness. Uh, 911 is called and the patient comes into the Stanford ER at about 4.30. And one of the things that we do at Stanford to expedite the evaluation of the stroke patients is if the paramedics call in and say, uh, it sounds like a stroke on the, the radio, then that patient is going to go straight into the CT scan. And we found that that's had a huge impact on being able to speed up our door to treatment time. So in the CT scan, they get a uh, stroke protocol that includes a non-contrast CT, CT perfusion, and a CT angiogram. And we get the images out through this software that I mentioned called Rapid that show up on our phones. So we can get alerts to, to beep. Uh, and wake us up if we want, but this shows the CT angiogram. This is a nice collapsed image of the blood vessels that's prepared and the site of occlusion can be flagged here. So we can see that this 70 uh, year old woman has an occlusion of the right middle cerebral artery. So that's not a, a good vessel to have blocked since that provides majority of blood flow to the right hemisphere of the brain. We can look at it in different uh, angles so we know what's going on. The non-contrast CT can show us if there is any damage that can be easily seen on the CT scan. So there's an automated assessment saying that there's already some early damage going on in the basal ganglia in the right hemisphere, but the cortex looks pretty good. Uh, but the most helpful scan, uh, I would argue, is the CT perfusion. So this is a scan that we've worked on uh, you know, over the last few decades to try to get uh, as informative as possible. And having this CT perfusion, which is now done at, at the vast majority of the hospitals that refer patients to Stanford, allow us to learn a lot about what's going on with the patient. One is these pink areas here show us tissue that is very likely to be already dead, and we can measure the volume, and it's fortunately a pretty small volume in this patient, uh, eight milliliters. And then the green area shows us tissue that is likely to go on to infarct if we don't do something. And the pattern of this green area tells us what we already saw from that CT angiogram is that this is a patient who's got a blockage of the main blood vessel, the right MCA, uh, you know, going to the right hemisphere. So the way this data is generated is here, we're looking at a contrast bolus given uh, in the scanner, and we're looking at how many seconds of delay does it take that contrast to get into the ischemic region? And if it's more than six seconds, it gets flagged in green. So that's giving us this large volume of 136 ml that's at risk of going on to die. But this pink volume is the area that already has a very low CBF. So the blood flow to the brain, the cerebral blood flow is reduced by more than 70% in this area. And this is a, a a, a CBF reduction that is not very compatible with uh, survival, particularly if it's been going on for more than a, an hour or two. And in this patient who is now uh, quite a few hours since they were last known well, we would assume this tissue is dead. But the good news is that the difference between the pink and the green is 128 milliliters. That's a tissue that we would call a penumbra, salvageable tissue. Uh, and now we have to decide what we're gonna do with this patient. So patient is currently seven and a half hours since last known well. Uh, the FDA uh, has intravenous thrombolysis approved out to three hours, but guidelines say it can be used out to 4.5. And I'll show you some more recent data to suggest that it can potentially be used successfully in the right patients out to nine hours. Uh, so that's the a question. Are we going to use intravenous thrombolytic therapy, uh, either TPA or this newer drug TNK? Are we going to go into the cath lab and physically pull the blood clot out with a, a catheter? Uh, or are we going to enroll this patient in a trial that I'll tell you about called Timeless? Uh, or since it's seven and a half hours after onset, is that really too late for an acute intervention? So I don't think we have any voting mechanism in, in this uh, 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 webinar, but uh, you know, this, this shows that there, there's a number of, of possibilities. Uh, 
Uh, in the past, during most of my career, when somebody showed up at seven and a half hours after they were last known well, there was no option for that patient. We would just say, I'm sorry, we wish you got in earlier so we could give you one of our treatments. But now we have a lot of options and we'll talk about these options over the course of the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So uh, to uh, outline what we're gonna talk about is how do these strokes evolve over time? How long do you have to salvage tissue in somebody who's having an acute stroke? Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the lessons learned from endovascular therapy. Uh, what's the longest that the penumbra can survive? When I was in med school, the thought was it could survive only a few hours. We now know that it can survive in some patients many, many hours. And then we'll talk about uh, thrombolysis uh, in, the, in the late treatment window and end up with a little bit about this new drug called TNK. So back in the 90s, one of the radiology faculty members at Stanford named Mike Mosley uh, was able to show that there was an MRI technique that could see strokes develop in real time. And we were really excited about this when we started the Stroke Center. And during the, the mid 90s, we started doing MRI scans on all stroke patients and eventually got an NIH grant to do an MRI scan four times on acute stroke patients. So we could see how that stroke lesion is gonna grow over time. And this is a typical patient um, uh, you know, that, that, that we saw. Uh, but one of the things to, to point out is that every patient was different, but, but this was not an unusual evolution to see. So here is this patient at the same time window that the woman that I just uh, showed you came in seven hours after last seen a well, and you can see the stroke was already of, of moderate size in, in this patient. And over the next uh, six hours, it didn't grow a whole lot, seemed relatively stable. And then after 13 hours, it more than doubled in size. So this stroke uh, got dramatically bigger over a long time window. And in some patients, we would see the stroke would be maximal at the first uh, picture and didn't get any bigger. Uh, but in other patients, we saw it continually growing uh, up to two to three days of growth, which was really, you know, hugely surprising. And, uh, and many people started to say, well, this diffusion imaging probably is not showing you what you think it's showing you because there's no way strokes could be growing uh, over two to three days. So... This was uh, you know, really interesting to see how the diffusion lesion evolved. And this diffusion lesion is showing you areas of energy failure that are essentially irreversibly injured. So we really think this is showing us the core damage of the stroke. Uh, but if the patient comes in at seven hours, how do you know that this is gonna become a really big stroke versus maybe it's not gonna grow anymore. It's already completed its journey. It's come to completion within seven hours. And what we found is that this perfusion map seemed to give us the answer to how big the stroke was gonna eventually be. So this is the perfusion scan that was done at seven hours in this patient. So this is equivalent to that green lesion that I showed you on the, on the recent patient that we didn't have the colors back then in 99. But what we could see from this is that this is a patient where there's considerable additional growth ahead because at the seven hour time, the diffusion lesion was much smaller than the perfusion. So what we called that was the perfusion diffusion mismatch. And this is an example of somebody who has the smaller diffusion, the larger perfusion lesion. And what we could see is that those patients who had this mismatch, if they did not have the blood flow restored, they would tend to grow into that larger perfusion lesion. But if they had the blood uh, uh, vessel opened, uh, which at that time we could only do with IV TPA, then the infarct would not grow. It would stay this smaller size. So we would sometimes see when we would scan these patients, people who came in with what we would call a matched deficit. In other words, the diffusion lesion and the perfusion lesion were the same. And those patients were not very exciting. They didn't grow regardless of whether they reperfused or not. They had already appeared to complete their stroke. And then sometimes we'd see patients who'd come in and the diffusion lesion was larger than the perfusion lesion. In other words, this patient had already reperfused. We know that there was a, a blood uh, flow abnormality to cause this brain lesion, but by the time the patient came to us, their intrinsic uh, TPA clot dissolving system had dissolved the clot and there was no longer a perfusion lesion. 
the, the, this is somebody who doesn't need uh, clot dissolving medicine. You don't need to go after the clot because the clot is already gone. So this was the, the observation in, uh, boy, this again, uh, <laughs> 23 years ago. And it was not met with uh, a lot of enthusiasm. When we put in uh, grants or wrote papers, people generally said, you're, you're crazy. It is, is not possible that you're gonna be able to predict how strokes evolve. And what we, what we learned in medical school is that time is brain, strokes evolve quickly. If you can't treat them within a few hours, the horse is out of the barn. So the, the first evidence to really uh, counter that came in an amazing breakthrough of 2015. Uh, these were trials that used a new device to treat stroke rather than intravenous clot dissolving medicines, which are like Drano and dissolve clots from an IV infusion. These were stent retrievers. These were uh, little pieces of, of plastic uh, that were put up into the brain through a catheter. They got a hold of uh, the clot and physically pulled it off. And what happened is uh, these were essentially all six hour treatment window trials. They were all going on simultaneously and they were all published in the New England Journal in 2015. So five New England Journal trials on the same topic uh, using the same treatment in basically the same patients and all five studies were positive. So this completely changed the, the world and showed people that there was a six hour window to treat stroke, not the three hour window that had been approved by the FDA for TPA. And what's remarkable as you look across these studies is that although they selected uh, patients who looked very similar in the ER in terms of their neurologic deficit and their age and the blood vessels that were occluded, the results were quite different from these five positive trials. The x-axis here is showing the good outcome rate at 90 days. And a rank of the zero to two means that you're functionally independent. You can go about doing your activities of daily living essentially the same as you could before. So the percentages here from uh, this first study, Mr. Clean, it showed that 33% of the patients who were treated with a stent retriever device could do that. Whereas on the other end here, we have a study that took in patients that looked very similar and showed that 71% of the patients had this phenomenal recovery from their stroke. The yellow bars is the control group, which was basically IV TPA. So they're getting TPA therapy. And again, here the TPA group really doing quite poorly, 80% uh, not being functionally independent, only 20% being functionally independent. Where over on this side of the, the curve, you can see a pretty darn good response for giving IV TPA to somebody who has a large blood clot blocking off the middle cerebral artery or internal carotid artery. These are all big strokes that were happening. So why is it that the patients in both treatment arms did at least twice as well uh, on, on studies on the right side of the slide well, it's the imaging selection that was used for these trials. Over on the right, they used the software that I showed you with, with these pink and green maps. Over here, they used nothing but a plain CT scan. And they didn't look carefully at the CT to see if there was those subtle areas of injury that I showed you on that first patient, what we call a, a low aspect score. And then in between, they used uh, the aspect score. And then here, they used some collateral information about looking at how well the blood vessels were helping out the blocked blood vessel. So what you can see is that the more selective you were in terms of looking for patients who had that penumbral profile, who had a large volume of salvageable tissue, uh, that those type of patients were having the more dramatic good outcome rates and also their treatment effect, which is the difference between the yellow and the blue bar was much larger for the imaging selection uh, trials rather than the just get in with a CT scan uh, that doesn't show brain hemorrhage. So this was uh, interesting, but what the bottom line was, was regardless of how you selected the patients, these trials were a winner. So this completely changed the landscape for stroke therapy in 2015. The guidelines changed to jump from, uh, you know, three to four and a half hours where we could use the IV thrombolytics on out to six hours uh, to use the stent retriever.
And since the studies were positive, regardless of, of uh, the imaging selection, the, the idea was let's make this open to as many patients as possible. So we'll go with that aspect score as the minimum imaging required. So uh, if we jump back again, uh, this study didn't use the aspect score. These studies used aspects. These studies use the fancier perfusion imaging. So basically you need to do better than Mr. Clean to be uh, you know, meeting those guidelines that came out in 2015. So this was fantastic. It was a new standard of care for stroke and it meant that every hospital that sees stroke patients, uh, whether it's that your you know, stroke ready hospital, primary stroke center, they had to be thinking about how do I identify these patients who are within six hours and could be eligible uh, because of their MCA or ICA occlusion to be zipped off to somewhere that can pull the clot out of their brain with a stent retriever. But this was not long enough to deal with the, the vast majority of patients who have these large vessel occlusions, because just like the patient I showed you, uh, about 25% of patients wake up with a stroke. And our patient woke up more than seven hours after she was last seen normal, which meant she would not have qualified for those five New England Journal trials. Uh, she would have been out of luck because she was beyond uh, six hours. The other thing is just in California, if you looked at that time at how many hospitals were within six hours of a, a center that was doing thrombectomy, it was not the majority. Throughout the central California, if you had your stroke, you were not going to get to Stanford or UCLA or UCSF within six hours. So six hours was not long enough. So the, the task was to shatter the stroke stopwatch and really push the time out for these patients who have good collaterals and maintain salvageable tissue for these long periods of time. So using the Mr. Clean uh, strategy of, you know, keep it simple, just do a plain uh, CT scan and, and enroll them if you don't see hemorrhage, you could see that the good outcome rates as you headed out to 16 hours were, were really not looking good. So this was not going to be a successful strategy to go into the late window. And even the aspect score shown here from data from um, the third study that was on that slide uh, from Spain called Revascat, if you look at patients with an acceptable aspect score, as they're getting out to 10 hours, you're starting to look at very low good outcome rates. So clearly we needed to use the more advanced imaging that had those phenomenal results in the six hour patient population. Could we push the time window out to 16 or 24 hours by finding patients who had this mismatch, small area of pink, large area of green, big area of salvageable tissue in the late time window. And uh, as you probably heard, these trials turned out to be highly successful. In fact, what was quite remarkable is that the treatment effect in these late window, six to 24 hour trials, uh, which are pooled together here as the combination of the Don and Diffuse results had a larger treatment effect than the pooled results of those five early window trials that I showed you a few slides ago. So this we call a paradox because it is not what anybody was suspecting. If you ask people, where are you gonna have the bigger treatment effect? Treating a patient within six hours or treating them between six and 24 hours? Nobody would have said treating between six and 24 hours. So we gotta take a few minutes here to try to explain the late window paradox. How could it be that we had a larger treatment effect in patients who were treated later with the same thrombectomy procedure uh, that was used in these early window trials. So one of the things, if you look at this slide, you notice is that the reason uh, that the treatment effect was bigger is not that the patients in the late window group did better in the thrombectomy arm. Here you can see that there was about half of the patients having an independent outcome in the six hour window trials and that same 50% of the patients were having that good outcome in the late window trials. So, it, I mean, it is very impressive that you could treat them late and maintain that 50% independent outcome. The reason the treatment effect was, was bigger had a lot to do with the comparison arm. In the early window, this yellow bar was IV thrombolysis. So these patients were getting IV TPA. In the late window, they were beyond the IV TPA window and you can see that these patients with large artery occlusion who came in late 
and were in the control arm. They got neither the thrombectomy nor the IV thrombolysis. They did pretty horrible. So the difference between the bars, the treatment effect was bigger. So let's dive into this a little deeper. So this is a graph that we made following the DIFFUSE-2 trial, which I haven't talked about, but it was a study where we looked at uh, treating patients up to about 16 hours after symptom onset. They, can't, they had to be uh, imaged within uh, 12 hours and could have reperfusion uh, within the next few hours. And this is a subgroup uh, analysis of the trial, looking at patients who had known onset times, large vessel occlusion, big vessels occluded, the middle cerebral or the internal carotid. They had witnessed onset and they came in and we got an MRI scan and we looked at how big the stroke was. And you could look at how many patients have a big stroke within four hours. And the answer was about 20%. Uh, and, and if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the, the other groups here, what you can see is if you look at, say, a, a relatively small stroke is less than 50 to 70 ml, that there are a group of 50% of the patients who even all the way out to 14 hours are maintaining a relatively small stroke. So 50% of the patients are growing slowly. And as I said, sometimes these patients don't grow at all, and then they take off, but it's not a minority of the patients, it's a uh, half of the patients have this very slow growth. 20%, which is a minority, have this incredibly malignant growth. So as you get up to, to six hours, you're seeing these very large uh, volumes, and as you get up to eight or 10, these are huge completed strokes. So these are the very unfortunate patients who have terrible collaterals and they finish their stroke very quickly. And some of these patients finish it before they can even get into the ER, um, which is very sad, but it's a minority and then 30% are in between. So we published, uh, well, we tried to publish this data um, more than a decade ago and the reviewers basically said, I don't believe it. This can't be the case that 50% of the patients grow slowly. But subsequently, we, we have been able to verify it. And the results of the trials that I just talked to you about was one additional verification of, the, of this data. If you look at the early window trials, like Mr. Clean, who took all comers within six hours, they're going to capture this 20% that grow quickly. And basically, the horse is out of the barn before you pull the clot out of there. And pulling the clot out and restoring blood flow to a large area of dead brain did not do this 20% uh, of patients any favors. In fact, it may have made some of them worse or caused hemorrhages. The uh, SWIFT Prime and Extend IA, those two studies to the right that I showed you that were looking at the advanced imaging to make sure they were getting the patients with good collaterals. They were grabbing these favorable patients in the early window. They had better outcomes. And then the Diffuse 3 and Dawn, by coming in and on average, those patients were being enrolled at 12 to 14 hours, and they typically had to have a, a core volume in Dawn less than 50 or in Diffuse 3 less than 70, basically guaranteeing you, cherry picking if you like, these people in the green zone. We were grabbing these 50% in the green zone and as we screened for these trials, we found that the 50% did hold true. That a patient, patients who show up with a large vessel occlusion at 12 hours, 50% still had a small core, and then 50% didn't. They were up in the, the yellow or the, the red range. And you could see that these patients have a huge treatment effect because we are identifying those that have the slow growth. So just to, to uh, you know, put a, a sharper point on that, here is um, the Mr. Clean uh, study showing what happens now for the treatment effect over time when you select patients just with a plain CT scan and uh, Diffuse 3 and Dawn were combined in what's called the Aurora cohort. And that shows you that the treatment effect is not modified by, by time. That whether somebody was coming in uh, you know, at six and a half hours or 14 hours, their treatment benefit did not decline over time, which is something that is very unusual because we have seen trial after trial over the years showing this time is brain, this uh, very uh, you know, unfortunate downward slope that your treatment effect is disappearing within a short number of hours. But when you use studies that select patients based on that penumbral imaging, 
identifying that 50% who grow slowly, you do not find that the treatment effect is modified by time. This is a paper we just published uh, three months ago, um, you know, from this Aurora database that now has combined a, a couple of additional trials that had some patients treated beyond six hours with thrombectomy. And you could see that if you had the perfusion imaging and you could tell that they were in one of these favorable mismatch subgroups, there's a very desirable treatment effect. This is the, the good outcomes here in the thrombectomy versus the control group, this huge benefit, and many fewer patients winding up dead or severely disabled. But if you look at patients where you didn't look, you didn't take the picture to figure out if they were in the red, yellow, or green group, then we do not see uh, this favorable shift. In fact, we wound up seeing more patients winding up in the dead or severely disabled group in the treatment group than in the control. And this difference in treatment effect for these perfusion selected patients versus those who didn't was statistically significant. So now if we showed you that we can have this group of patients having terrific benefit out to 24 hours, the next question is, can you go beyond that? You know, is there you know, any time limit to, so to patients who could still potentially benefit from uh, reperfusion stroke therapy? So this is a study that we did from the control group of the diffuse three study. Remember half of the patients at diffuse three did not get the thrombectomy. They all came in with a favorable imaging profile. And then the question is, we imaged the patients 24 hours later. And on average, they came in, as I said, about 12 hours after symptom onset. So here we're looking at imaging at 37 hours. And is it possible that some patients at 37 hours still have favorable imaging profiles? Well, you'd probably say yes from data that I showed you from way back in the 1990s, but here is uh, you know, 2019 proof that 20% of these patients who came in uh, with the target mismatch profile and got enrolled in a, a 16 hour treatment window trial 24 hours later, 20% continue to have a favorable profile. So the favorable profile is clearly disappearing over time. The amount of salvageable tissue is disappearing. On average, it was about 100 mLs when they came in 24 hours earlier, but now a day later, it was 50% in these 20% of patients. So let's take a look at one of these patients, uh, what they look like, uh, who is fortunate enough to have phenomenal collaterals. So this 73 year old woman had a, a wake up stroke. So we don't know exactly how many hours, but uh, you know, she went to bed the night before, she wakes up, she comes in and she is eligible for the diffuse three trial because she has this nice mismatch. She has a right MC occlusion. Typically patients with a right MC occlusion will have at least hundred ML of this green perfusion abnormality. Hers is about half of what we suspect because she had phenomenal collaterals. And see all the holes in this uh, lesion? These are holes because other blood vessels are helping out the blocked off right middle cerebral artery. So she's got a, a relatively small perfusion deficit, even though she comes in paralyzed on the left side of the body. She's got a, a lot of tissue that's not functioning normally. She's lucky at this time because only a, a small amount of tissue has that irreversible injury shown in pink, but she was unlucky in that she got enrolled in the control group. So she did not have the blood clot pulled out. The blood clot remained there. And now we can see 24 hours later what's happened to her. So if we take a look 24 hours later, what we can see is that this green lesion has nearly doubled in size and a lot of the holes are filled in. So what that means is the blood vessel is still occluded, but the collaterals are failing. These other blood vessels that were helping out the blocked one, they can't help out forever and we start to see a larger area of tissue that's likely to go on to die. Now we would expect that she may go on to have a stroke as big as 70 mLs. And she's already had some growth, but it's not massive growth over that 24 hours. She went to from five to, to, to 27 mLs. So, uh, you know, one would wonder if we went in now at this point, 24 hours after she'd been enrolled, so 24 hours after she woke up with her stroke, could we pull out the clot and help this person? Well, that wasn't part of the protocol. We left her alone. Eventually the clot disappears on its own. And by three days later, the clot had disappeared, but the stroke had grown to 70 ml. So this is that evolution that uh, nobody believed in when we talked about it 20 years earlier, 
but, but now people are starting to realize and say, yes, of course, there are these patients who have the slow growth and could benefit later. So just to show you her in a little more detail, this is that growth that occurred between uh, about 30 hours after her stroke and two more days later. So here we are growing that stroke. This is not just brain swelling, this is recruitment of tissue going on to infarct in cortical regions. So can you go wild and treat patients at 44 hours after symptom onset? Well, in Korea, they decided to be very bold. This is not a randomized trial. This was published in JAMA Neurology uh, now uh, almost a, a couple years ago here. Um, 150 uh, patients retrospect retrospectively identified where ones who had favorable imaging, they went ahead and treated them uh, all the way out to two days after stroke onset and uh, compared them to propensity matched controls. And what they found is that it looked like these patients appeared to benefit. Again, case control, not a randomized study, but if they looked at patients who met that imaging criteria for diffuse three, the, the small pink, big green mismatch profile, they saw what appeared to be very good outcomes among these patients. And again, the idea that we should not have any arbitrary time windows for stroke, we shouldn't go by the stopwatch, we should look at the brain tissue and we should say, is there salvageable tissue? Do we have imaging evidence of salvageable tissue? If we do, the time is not the key issue. Treat them uh, and, and try to restore blood flow. So we have very definitive data now from thrombectomy studies where you go in with a clot and pull out, uh, go in there with a catheter and pull out the clot to say that we can do successful late window therapy. Can we do the same with IV thrombolysis? Obviously not every hospital has a, a group that can do thrombectomy for stroke. Can we treat patients like the one that I showed you at the beginning showing up seven and a half hours after she was last known well with an IV thrombolytic? Well, our history of this was not very good. These are 12 large randomized trials that tried to break the 4.5 hour time barrier for IV thrombolysis. All 12 of them failed. All of them fell prey to this curve that we've seen in many, many IV thrombolysis trials. It's the time as brain curve that you get a nice treatment response if you treat patients in the golden hour, you know, 60, 90 minutes, 120 minutes, big treatment effect. As you start heading out towards four or five, six hours, that treatment effect has gone down to zero. So this treatment effect has now been broken um, by a couple of trials. Uh, the one that has, has really broken it is called EXTEND. Uh, the wake up trial used a trick to try to identify patients who wake up, but have had a stroke within four and a half hours. And this trick was called the DWI flare mismatch. So if you do an MRI scan and you look at two different imaging sequences, one that we've talked about the DWI that shows you how big the stroke is at the minute, and then the flare, which generally takes about four and a half hours to turn positive, you can then look for people who are DWI positive, but you can't see the stroke on the flare. So that was a trick that this group used in Europe to identify patients who woke up with a stroke, but their stroke was likely in the very early morning hours, and they showed that they could have a successful treatment effect giving TPA to those wake up stroke patients who met this imaging profile. So that's good, but it doesn't truly extend the time window because what it is, it's treating patients who were within five, four and a half hours of their stroke. This is the breakthrough study that showed patients could be treated within nine hours of last seen well using that same mismatch profile that I showed you, the, the small pink and big green uh, that was used in those uh, two um, six hour treatment window trials that had the big effect and then the two late window trials, the Dawn and Diffuse 3. So here is the EXTEND trial. It was published in the New England Journal. It shows a favorable benefit for the TPA group, not a huge treatment effect, but it was statistically significant with a, a relative risk of 1.44 for being less disabled in the TPA group all the way out to nine hours. And then this pooled analysis that came out the next month uh, in the Lancet, which took two other trials that treated patients with TPA uh, 
up to nine hours and ran the data from those trials through the software to see if we could identify patients who have the favorable imaging profile, the nice imaging profile we call the mismatch profile, and separate out those who have the unfavorable imaging profile. And this is very telling because when you pool these together, you have a much better statistical significance showing the benefit of the treatment all the way out to nine hours with the IV alteplase, which is TPA versus placebo. This is uh, now highly statistically significant. And then you see the reason why the studies that didn't separate out uh, the favorable profile from the unfavorable profile failed to show benefit. Look at these patients who got enrolled in these trials, four and a half to nine hour window, but when you run them through the software, they don't have a favorable profile. Uh, most of these patients had that completed infarct, no mismatch profile, and some of them had a very large core, but most of them, the infarct looked completed. So look at the mortality rate, 17% in the TPA arm, 4% in placebo. Look at the severe disability. These are patients who are uh, confined to a nursing home and can do none of their activities of daily living. It was twice as high in the uh, TPA group. So you've got evidence of harm here and evidence of benefit here. When you combine them together, no wonder we've had so many negative late window trials. When you pull them apart, <coughs> you can have a nice treatment effect all the way out to nine hours. So I'm gonna finish and uh, let's see, I don't have my watch on. Let's see how much time we've got. to try to finish in the next couple of minutes, just mentioning that uh, we are making a shift uh, and have already made the shift at Stanford to, from TPA, the standard clot buster, to TNK, which is a, a sister molecule that has just a, a tiny three amino acid change, but increases fibrin specificity. It can be given as a single bolus rather than a bolus in a one hour infusion. And we've got some data to suggest that at least for some type of stroke patients, it is more effective than TPA in dissolving clots particularly some of the larger clots, like ones that are in the middle cerebral artery. It's also a benefit that it is less expensive than TPA. So again, the reasons why we're excited about it is that if you give somebody a TPA infusion, it is hard to transport them during that hour of the infusion. It's very hard to get an MRI scan on them. Uh, and there's you know, things that can go wrong with an infusion. This is a single bolus, so it's very quick. Uh, it can reduce the door to needle time, and in fact, since we started using this at Stanford, we've seen about a 15 minute decrease in our door to needle time because it's quicker to mix up and, and administer. And then, you know, the real question is, is it truly more effective and does it have fewer hemorrhagic complications? So just to highlight uh, some data, the first uh, encouraging study uh, came out in the New England Journal in 2012, relatively small study. It was using patients selected with CT perfusion, so sort of these favorable imaging patients, showed C uh, TNK was safer and more effective. Then there was a trial looking at very mild patients that was done in Europe. Uh, it used a higher dose of TNK, which is, then is currently favored. The favored dose is 0.25 milligram per kilogram. This basically showed no difference either in safety or efficacy for these small stroke patients TPA versus TNK, it was a bit of a, a wash there. But the study that's really got us excited about TNK is this one that was published in 2018 called Extend IA TNK. This is using a TNK rather than TPA in the type of patients that we've been talking about. These thrombectomy patients who have a middle cerebral artery or internal carotid artery, large vessel occlusion, and they're given the, the TNK versus TPA on their way into the cath lab to have the thrombectomy procedure. And what they found is that 22% of the patients who were given this with a large vessel occlusion, by the time they got into the cath lab for the thrombectomy, uh, the, the clot had been dissolved uh, in the TNK group. And in the TPA group, it was only 10%. So as twice as many patients had that early clot dis dissolution with the TNK and didn't need the thrombectomy alone. And here's some of the data from that study showing the 22 versus the 10. Uh, no difference in brain hemorrhage. Uh, what you see is a strong trend toward low lower mortality with the TNK versus the TPA. And the uh, outcome uh, in terms of favorable outcome was better uh, 
here's that shift in the Rankin scores where we've got more patients having these really good favorable uh, Rankin outcome disability scores in the TNK versus the Alteplase group and fewer patients having the, the mortality or these uh, you know, severe uh, you know, stuck in the nursing home, can't do any activities of daily living. So this certainly looked like a, a win for TNK. So uh, I'll finish with mentioning the timeless study. This is basically kind of a, a marriage of that extend IATNK study that I showed you uh, with Diffuse 3, trying to take IV thrombolysis into a late time window and doing what makes sense is if you need the thrombectomy, you still do the thrombectomy. But if the TNK can dissolve the clot and do the job itself, then you're, you're great. But really having both treatments available in an extended time window should be the, the, the most optimal way to treat these patients. So it is a late window trial. We're giving IV thrombolytics as long as far as 24 hours after symptom onset. So latest ever to give IV thrombolysis, but you have to have the favorable imaging uh, uh, profile. So you get the TNK versus placebo. It's placebo rather than TPA is the comparison because we're beyond 4.5 hours. As I said, FDA allows TPA out to three, but guidelines go to 4.5. Uh, and what we are hoping to do is um, you know, finish this study within the next six months and a, a year from now be able to present what would be a more comprehensive therapy for patients who come in uh, in the, the late time window. So to, uh, to summarize, uh, guidelines for late IV window thrombolysis are in, in evolution. We talked about that wake-up study can allow you to treat wake-up patients with the flare DWI mismatch. The EXTEND study showed benefit up to four and a half to nine hours. Uh, the guidelines in Australia have already adopted this. In Europe, they're favorable towards this. The U.S. has been slow. Our guidelines are waiting for more data because this is really only a single trial. Although that pooled analysis that I showed you, I think is very compelling with the three different studies showing the benefit. Um, and then we're waiting for more results on the TNK. So some centers are saying, look, I wanna see some of these additional TNK studies that are ongoing. Uh, but many of the academic centers, including Stanford said, I'm convinced by the data that is out there on TNK. It's less expensive, it's easier, more convenient, cut the door to needle time. So we made the, uh, the plunge uh, a couple months back to uh, switch uh, TPA to TNK. So I'm going to stop at this point and hope I've saved a few minutes for questions or comments. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, that was really, again, another tour de force and, and really bringing together all the data that shows that we have flips acute stroke therapy on its head, that you can treat patients up to 24 hours, maybe longer in Korea and um, leverage the technology that's available. And on that point, I wanted to invite um, Jim Hensgetter, one of our stroke survivors, patient advocates, and co-founder of the Stroke Awareness Foundation, um, to answer a question I had that, you know, this data on the extended stroke window has been coming out, even on the IV thrombolysis out to nine hours, you know, that's been out for a year now. Are patients, Getting this, do, do you are do your you know constituents in this awareness foundation are they aware that there are so many prolonged therapy options? I'd love to hear how this research is translating to the real world. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. And it's a very good question. I I, uh, I don't I honestly don't believe that this uh, wonderful study and these results, which I have to say I am extremely impressed with. Um, have really gotten into the into the field, uh, bait the, what I call the field um, thus far, to my knowledge. However, seeing the results of all of this, why there's no reason <laughs> that this shouldn't be looked at very seriously um, by you know in our area, all of the uh, uh, comprehensive stroke centers that we have, and, and uh, primary uh, to move that time needle away. I love the fact that that uh, the time aspect of it has now begun to become less and less important. That is crucial. And as a stroke survivor myself, I can say you've had all of us who have had strokes, uh, 
this is really an important aspect of study. Thank you very much, both of you. And Dr. Albers, you know how I feel about it. And when I read it in the beginning, I was glad to send a note to you congratulating you on all of these successes. Keep going. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. Much appreciated. Awesome. We can open it up to additional questions. Dr. Uh, Scott Lynn. Hey, Ed, you here. Yeah. A fantastic talk over here. Uh, should I go to, should I let Scott go first? Go ahead, Scott. Doesn't matter, Ed. Go ahead. I'll go with you. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the world. This is so exciting. Um, inevitably, I think this is going to go to a point where patients may have a choice about do you do thrombolytics or do you do the endovascular uh, approach? Uh, sounds like that now it's going to be trending that way. How do you think we're going to be able to answer that? Uh, I know there's no clinical trials doing head to head studies, sounds like. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, we, we talked about getting rid of stopwatch, but it's not the point that we don't want to treat patients as soon as they possibly can be treated, right? The, you know, we, we never know when the stroke is going to grow, how quickly it's going to grow. We want to treat them as soon as possible. So suppose the patient winds up to a center that doesn't do thrombectomy, right? There's only a limited number of centers that do the thrombectomy. Even if they come in late, we want them to be able to start their treatment with the thrombolytic, right? Particularly with TNK, so easy to give, just a shot. In few, you know, shoot it in over a minute, you're, you're done. And then that patient, if they've got a large vessel occlusion, should be making the journey to a place that can more definitively pull that clot out. If the TNK can dissolve it in a quarter of the patients, that's fantastic because it's going to dissolve it earlier. Uh, but by the time they get to Good Sam or Stanford or UCSF or wherever it is that's going to do that more definitive clot removal therapy, if the clot is still there, you want to get it out as soon as possible. So it's really, a, a, you know, a two-tiered treatment. Start the thrombolysis as quickly as possible, right? So again, even if a patient shows up directly to, to Good Sam, start the, the thrombolytic in the ER, you know, because sometimes this great thrombectomy therapy you can't get the clot out, right? The anatomy is very tortuous. So at least you've got the thrombolytic in there trying to do its thing while you try to get the catheter into the right spot and pull out the clot. And I want to build on that. That's really critical what you said, Greg. These therapies that you're hearing about in the extended window, they're not for everyone. And so it's, it's still really important that our patients understand to prevent disability, they need to come as soon as possible because it's much broader group that is eligible for IV thrombolysis before four and a half hours. And then, you know, we still need that advanced imaging, et cetera, to start to treat some of these other patients, whether it's thrombolytics or thrombectomy, or as Greg said, both in many cases. Yeah, so we don't want our patients to be falsely reassured that they can take their time, but the options are much more available once they do get here. It's a super important message there because you don't want people to hear, oh, we have a, we now we have a 24 hour window to treat stroke. I don't need to rush in, right? Because you want to treat that stroke as quickly as possible. We're rushing. We want that patient to rush in. The point is just because you came in late, right? Because you couldn't get in earlier doesn't mean give up. Let's take a picture and see if there's salvageable tissue. Let's Let's time the brain and see if we still have time. And oftentimes we do, so we can treat. But clearly, as you look at people who show up at 12 hours, as I said, half of them, we can't help. Their stroke is done. But for the half that it's not done, we want to dive in and help them. Thanks. Okay, Scott, you're up. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, great presentation. Absolutely outstanding. Uh, loved it. Um, this, again, what you're pointing out is medicine one size does not fit all, right? And yep. patient selection Precision criteria medicine. are actually key. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And um, patient selection criteria is, is key and critical. So well done for showing that. I wait to see what's what's coming next because I think you're, you've just opened up a whole box of things that are coming. Um, from the payer's perspective, something doesn't sound right. So this new uh, therapy, it it um, it causes uh, it, it has. Um, it's more convenient because you give it one time, right? It's there's it's more effective. It has no worse side effects. It has at least equal side effects. It costs less. So coming, uh, I'm working at a payer now. My question is, what's the catch? Yeah. When is the company that makes it going to jack the price up? Because there's just three reasons why they say, oh, there's more value in this. No, I'm going to jack the price up. It sounds like a winner. Yeah. So that's that's so, great to hear. 
So that's great to say, what's the catch? So uh, probably the catch is that it is not FDA approved for stroke at this point. That's one of the reasons we're doing the, the timeless study. The fact that something's right. not FDA approved doesn't mean we don't use it, right? We use men's medications right. for all sorts of indications that the FDA has. Exactly. Uh, but yeah. some people, yeah. and usually, you know, what happened, we've sort of been through this before where, um, you know, I didn't, you know, focus on this today, but we had the three hour window for TPA. And then there was a study that came out called ECAS3, which showed benefit out to four and a half hours. And Genentech, who's the maker, took it to the FDA and the FDA said, not enough data. It's only one study treatment. The effect wasn't big enough. Yeah, it was statistically significant, but show me another one before I clear it for you. And Genentech never went back. They, so what happened is the American Heart Association came out and said, we're convinced this is a you know four and a half hour drug. Give it to four and a half hours. So who did it first? The academic places and uh, but and the community hospitals were slow to catch on because they said, well, you know, what if I give it and there's a brain hemorrhage? It's not FDA approved. You know, but then eventually now all the community hospitals give TPA to four and a half hours. And I think we're going to see the exact same thing with TNK. That the the academic centers, UCSF is thinking about moving to it. We've done it, UCLA's done it, a lot of the other big hospitals have done it, but it, it is not FDA approved yet. Uh, and, and I know some of the community hospitals are gonna say, hey, you know, I'm worried about medical legal risk. I give this TNK, somebody has a brain hemorrhage, right? There's a small risk of brain hemorrhage, certainly no higher than TPA's risk, but uh, some people just don't like to give unapproved drugs. So that, that, I think that's the catch for right now. Right. And it, so it's still like the 10% or so, that like the 10, 15% that end up with the bleed. Right. That's the number that end up with the, 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 bleed, bleed the, the bleed rate is actually very low. It depends on how you define a bleed, but the bleed rates from TPA or, or TNK for a typical stroke patient are in the range of 3%, you know, 3 to 4%. So it, it, wow, it's, that low. Yeah. it's quite low. Yes. It's not a high bleed rate. Um, but, uh, you know, again, but you uh, only need one case and get sued one time before there you go, right? Exactly. Exactly. So you're more likely to be sued for not treating an ischemic stroke patient than having a bleed. So that's what precedent has shown, at least for TPA. So, so you know, we, we will encourage sites to, to, to flip to TNK because anything that can get the patient to us faster, and if people are holding up you know, their transfer, which they often do, particularly ambulance transfers, they wait an hour till that TPA is in and then they transfer. So I think there's a lot of benefits to the TNK. It's just, you know, it hasn't been around for 25 years like TPA and they're, you know, just, you know, people get nervous with new stuff, right? That there's the anxiety about doing something that it, it hasn't gotten the big endorsement from the AHA guidelines yet. There's ongoing studies that we'd like to see completed, but you know, our group was convinced and I have to say our pharmacists were pushing us for a couple of years on this because they saw the cost savings and, you know, TPA can be a decent chunk of your pharmacy bu budget. It's quite expensive. TNK is a bargain right now. And, and hopefully the company will, will not crank it up, but can't guarantee what any company is going to do. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully this won't take the usual 17 years to get more adopted and, um, it's you know, already happening. Medicine. It's already don't, don't be the first person to be doing something, but also don't be the last, right? You don't necessarily yeah. be the first one because that's where a lot of the fun starts. So, all right, well, well done. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was just saying that the adoption is already happening across the nation. Actually, we're seeing our circles, and I think that very soon it will be um, the more popular option. All right, well, we are past six o'clock. Are there any other questions? I don't see any others unanswered in the chat. And um, for, for Dr. Albers myself or Dr. Sandu. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Hattie to share the next event and just thank everyone for coming and listening to this stroke heart brain day. So I just want to say how incredibly impressed I am by both presentations, all three presentations today. What a hopeful era with my mother having died of a stroke as a very young woman. Uh, I believe that people have a much better opportunity for survival now. I was fascinated, Greg, by you talking about a patient uh, who has phenomenal collaterals. And I'm wondering whether those are among your high. Uh, 
exercising public? You know, I suspect they are. We don't have the data to, to prove that, but you, you, you got onto the million dollar question or maybe the Nobel Prize winning question. How can we improve people's collaterals uh, and, and how can we be that lucky patient who could be treated at 44 hours or 24 hours? And I suspect exercise is part of it, but uh, we need genetics is probably a part of it too. And there are probably a bunch of factors that we don't know. Some of it may just be the anatomy of how the blood vessels are, are, are fitting together there. So um, that's a, I always say when we talk to the, the fellows or the residents, that th this is the question for your generation. How can, we, how can we get those collaterals pumped up so that we're ready when we have the stroke that we can have the phenomenal outcomes that I showed for, for these patients who do have good collaterals? So another question uh, is, our dream in the Right Care Initiative is to get to zero preventable disabilities and deaths from strokes and heart attacks. And we know the formula is greater than what we are driving right now, which is blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol. I believe there's quite a bit more on the stroke side, just, you know, as a distance observer for 15 years. And I'd like you to dream big with us. We did just win a national award uh, from the National Forum for Heart Attack and Stroke Prevention. And we would love to have you join us in thinking about if you wanted to get to zero disabilities and deaths for, for stroke in your community, give us your dream sheet. What, what you know, think about, um, think about that challenge of getting towards zero. And I should just listen to a few of your thoughts before I say our next meeting is January 10th. You've got very lofty goals there. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I tell you, I'll, I'll put my mind to it and see if we can come up with things, but uh, it, it's, stroke is tough. It's a, it's a very challenging disease. It's very heterogeneous. Every stroke is different and we have all sorts of different causes. So getting down to zero is a very lofty goal, but, uh, you know, I, I think that the new generation of folks is, is up for the challenge and, and, and can help us get there. But as you can see, what, what I talked about today spanned my, uh, almost my entire career. So it really takes a lot of patience and persistence to, to make some of these advances. So many of our volunteers are up around 80 years old, Greg. You are nowhere near there and you're not allowed to exit stage left anytime soon. <laughs> I have You've no intention a long to. No intention to, yeah. Long, long star-filled uh, career ahead of you. And you should have won a Nobel Prize for this incredible yeah. work you've done. Who, who can nominate him? Yeah. So I just have to say, you know, be still my heart. The scientists of the world are just making uh, life so much better for the patients of America, those who are around such... Uh, wonderful medical centers as Stanford, Cedars, Sinai that we had presenting today are the lucky ones. And the question is, how do we get that out, maybe with more telemedicine, to the hinterlands? Um, so I know you're very busy. You've got patients waiting for you. I just want to say, maybe we should just schedule an annual update from you so that we don't lose out on this incredible progress you're making and um we need better ways to get to more people but we had a big crowd with us tonight and people are very excited about this extended window and the new technologies i really think i don't think you heard dr sandu's presentation but i think groupies work with apple um and also stanford's work with apple is that is the future because, you know, what we can learn from our little devices, we're all learning together. It's such new information, but I think it is part of what is going to help us on the stroke frontier. Great. And I would love to um, help with uh, any sort of study that you might like to do with all of our right care partners across the state. 
Well, thanks so much. Congratulations on the great work you're doing. Take care. All right. Thank you thanks, so much. Everyone. We'll see you next year. Yeah. Happy Thank holidays. Thank you, everyone. everyone. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye. See you guys next year. Thank you. Oh, that was lovely. So thank you, Right Care team. And